not heard that song since I was a child running around in the basement of a church that no longer exists. Um, God is still good through all time. Uh, will you pray with me, people? Creator God, this morning give us ears to hear the still quiet of your voice, hearts that are vulnerable and open, and eyes watching and waiting to see your light breaking in through us and through this world. Remind us of this comfort of your presence if we could turn and cling to it. Pour out your spirit. Guide us deeper, further up, further in. Amen. Amen. Today's readings are from Henry Nouwen's The Wounded Healer and from Paul's second epistle or his letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 12, verses 2 through 10 read so faithfully by Pastor Sarah, and we will talk about the passage she read of Father Henry Nowens later, but I want to begin my word this morning by getting right into the thick of it with Paul. The Apostle Paul and I have really kind of an interesting, uh, if at times combative, relationship, having been raised in evangelical churches that really love to kind of whip out Paul really only as an apologetical exhibit A to justify often incredible and obscene feats of, you know, theological queerphobia and transphobia. I'd kind of had enough of Paul, but seminary in my older life has humanized Paul, and I'm really as glad to say that as I am aware that I ought to say that, because Pauline theology is foundational for Christian theology. I really want to be clear. I also want to say that there are times and spaces where deference is shown to these interpretations of Paul where he is only a brunt, blunt instrument of systematic theology where in his letters he only lays the groundwork for the next 2,000 years of interpretation on things like Jesus' teaching, his death, our salvation, and the function and the role of the church in the world. These letters are sometimes hard, and he is speaking hard truth and uh, claiming the raw truth of Christ just plainly and clearly for these people. He is also sometimes, I'm going to be honest, just making up words in Greek, which is uh, the first wrong turn that homophobes take with Paul, but I digress. Um, I think that it has largely been my discomfort with Paul. It is challenging to read him because it is challenging and hard for me not to hear his words as they were once read to me, as this blunt instrument of law yielded by certain powers, certain principalities. When I read this letter um, and a number of others now Working my way through seminary, I hear my own hopes for ministry and Paul's sardonic humor and his aching candor as well. When I read Paul's letters like this, I remember that he was a pastor to many small, many burgeoning and difficult churches. I hope as well to offer us a vision for our own collective work as this body with his pastoral theology and systematic theology, how we might hold our hopes for this church, our community, our salvation, and the world. Here at Hyde Park Union Church, we take the priesthood of all believers seriously, and not just because we're Protestant, uh, that the work of this church, both the clergy and the laity, from the food pantry to hosting coffee hour, to planning for the long-term use and sustainability of this building, to music, all of that is ministry. That even as our growing power, in our growing power as a church, we remember what the source of our power is. The movement of God in and through our wounds and our weaknesses. This keeps coming up for me, this understanding that God will co-opt what hurt I have experienced for God's joy and love and liberation. And it came up a lot for me when I visited St. John's Abbey up in Minnesota this May with my friends at the First Presbyterian Church of Chicago. For the record, when you uh, all ask me where I've been, I'm usually at home finishing late homework assignments or um, there at first, mostly the former. The Foundation for Theological Exploration provided a grant for the church to help young people uh, discern things, just broadly. So we went on a retreat up to Minnesota, up to Collegeville with the Benedictines, and we saw some monks and a lot of nuns we stayed at the guest house overlooking Lake Sagatagan, which was surrounded by this dense forest that the monks who founded the monastery called the Beautiful Valley. I did honestly much prefer to be out in the woods, uh, romping around and skipping morning prayer like I did skipping uh, morning camp meetings at, as a kid. And honestly, more of that than to be with the group sometimes. But that 
eco-theological bit is, is it's another sermon. The sermon is, in fact, about skipping church. Because uh, I went to morning prayer only once. At 7 a.m., I walked with others in the group to the main sanctuary at St. John's. The walls in that church are concrete, save the one wall on the far end that is an enormous honeycomb panel of primary colored stained glass and a crucifix hangs suspended above this giant plain concrete altar, Christ dangling by industrial grade wire above a panel of theater grade lighting. And the monks sat in their round loft and we prayed the hours with them and honestly, it did alarm me a little bit to realize that I was in a room, save for a handful of us, uh, that were men. And I know this about the Catholic Church. It is an operative condition of the Catholic Church. And it's honestly why I felt more at home with the nuns. And it was fine until uh, the point monk for the trip uh, turned the pages of the prayer book to the canticle we were on for me. Um, and I understand the intent behind the gesture to make sure that I was not lost, that I felt welcome, that I knew what I was doing, but his sudden close physical proximity and also the assumption that I had not prayed the er hours before or could not just read that sign over there, um, it did kind of it pinged me a little bit. What kept me from going back again was when he asked us if we believed in the real presence of Christ at the Eucharist during communion. Pastor Black swooped in and told him what Reformed theology thinks about that. The monk was like, eh, good enough, but instructed us really to not be awkward about communion. He said he sometimes won't serve people communion if they are awkward about taking it, because then he knows that they are not Christian. I don't know. For me, awkward people have always been my favorite people to serve communion to, because if you want to eat, come and eat, my friend. I really believe firmly that it is not our table, it is God's, honestly, so much that I literally have it tattooed right here on my arm. And on Thursday, I was reflecting with a buddy who was on the trip about my reaction specifically to this monk. It seemed more personal than theological, I was told. Which is right, actually, though I didn't admit that then. Um, the conviction that was peaked, that was pinged, is both personal and theological. I have spent too much of my life standing against the walls of the church, starving and emaciated when I ought to, when I long to just sit at the table and ought to have been able to. For me, I will no longer beg for scraps and I will work so that no one else has to. Yes, I will, with God's help, thank you. And this was the culmination of that weekend of discernment, that I am called to point the church back to its roots, I feel called to point to Jesus, who even raised to life again bore his wounds and used them as a source of strength for his loved ones so that they might believe in the hard things to come. I feel I am called to point the church to that honest vulnerability. It is really only there that we will find our strength. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians follows this premise. And if we imagine as we do Paul as both a systematic and a pastoral theologian, it sheds a bit of light on this bewildering passage of scripture. For context, Paul in writing this letter is hoping to return to Corinth for another visit, following the last one, which didn't really not go well. Um, earlier in this book, Paul references a previous letter, which is referred to as the letter of tears or his severe letter. Paul admits honestly that he was afflicted by the conflict that happened the last time he was there, and he told them as much. In fact, given sort of the change in tone from the earlier chapters of 2 Corinthians from chapters 1 to 9, we can read uh, and understand this chapter in 10 through 13 where this passage lies as perhaps this very letter of tears. What brought Paul to this point was the people's denial of his authority as a pastor in favor of more electrifying preachers and more personable personalities. Paul to the Corinthians seems ill-equipped to handle their conflicts in person, though the letters he writes to the church, they're strong and they are evocative. There are these super apostles, as he calls them, who rival Paul, who put Paul in the shadows of the real work he is doing. These super apostles are stronger rhetoricians. They speak with more fervor. They speak with more excitement. Paul becomes then, as my, as my commentary notes, contemptible to the people he is responsible for shepherding. And they split into factions, identifying with those apostles rather than with Christ, which is a point Paul makes earlier to them in 1 Corinthians. 
These apostles boast about their exceptional visions and their revelations. And Paul, in our reading today, boasts as well and against that premise, against this premise that power comes from the grandeur and the mystery and the exceptional character of your vision. No, Paul says, my power comes from God in my weakness. Yet to be clear, Paul is in fact boasting like the super apostles in this text, he is subverting it. In the verse omitted from the lectionary reading this morning, verse one of chapter 12, Paul makes it clear that he will play this little game, but he's not gonna take the prize when he wins. He shares his vision remaining vague, but just with a few details. That he went to the third heaven, the highest heaven where God dwells in Jewish cosmology at that time. He was either in or out of his body while he was there, and yet he imparts none of what he learned there to the people in this letter. He is not allowed to share the secrets of this paradise with mortals. He saw through the mirror, perhaps quite brightly, and to keep that intangible brightness, this, uh, the exceptional character of this vision from consuming him and being the source and the root of his power, he was given this thorn in his side. And thorn here is a translated word, feels a little bit euphemistic. Um, the word used here in Greek for thorn can also be used for stake, scolops. And by stake, we mean a sharp piece of military equipment used by Roman soldiers planted point up in the ground facing out to defend the collective. He does not assign a, really a moral value to this thorn. He says it is painful, but recognizes that it serves a function. The presence of the thorn reminds him of his own need of salvation. This passage calls to mind Jacob in Genesis 32, the patriarch of Israel who wrestled with God by the water. In that, in that battle, God dealt him a blow to the hip that left him with a limp for the rest of his life. And I have no doubt that this is what Paul had in mind when he went forward to boast, that he knew the root of his tradition and his heritage and he had clung to it. He knew seeing God, seeing God, that it changes you. It makes you different. It might make you even a little off-putting at the church function, but he has accepted that this is the case. God will use him anyway. To the end of this passage, he is adamant that he must accept this thorn. He wants it gone, he must accept it. And to some, this thorn might make him ineffective, but his admission of weakness, this personal experience within the theological points to the glory of God, he is fine to have his reputation ruined or whatever else the word, world has to throw at him. He says, whenever I am weak, then I am strong. On our way back from the monastery from St. John's, someone on the trip gave me a pin from a local anarchist bookstore in Minneapolis. It felt weird to wear it to preach, otherwise I would have shown it to you, but it has a barn on it. And it says, I will ruin you. And the buddy asked me if I felt seen by it. And to be honest, sorry girl, but no. I know like so many of you that I have endured hurt that lives in my body that I might carry with me for a long time. That hurt has tried to ruin me, but accepting my own ruin has taught me a great deal. It has taught me that mature power does not lie in ruination, but creation, not in destruction, but in making of things. That is peace, is the making of things in restoring what is broken, that I carry that power, and so do you, so do all of you. My ministry will not be to ruin the church or to tear it down, but to remind itself of the root of its power, a God who took on vulnerable flesh and lived and taught and died and rose again, still wounded all through it, and to call the church to act in accordance with the testimony of that incarnate God. Father Henry Nowen, a Catholic priest who wrote The Wounded Healer, which you heard from earlier, taught at some of the most prestigious divinity schools in the nation. He marched from Selma to Montgomery in 1965. His scholarship and advocacy was known the world over. At the end of his life, he decided to put that all behind him and serve at La Arche, where he worked and lived and served alongside of people with intellectual disabilities. Father Henry Nowen was also gay. He struggled a lot 
with his commitment to his vows as a priest of celibacy and the dissonance of his desire for love and for intimacy that he could not reach. His theology, when you read it, bleeds with the hope that in accepting our, accepting our own sources of shame and humiliation, we might better care for one another. We might better embody the love of the Messiah about whom now one speaks. From the Gospel of John, we know that Jesus' body remains wounded after his resurrection when Thomas puts it in his side to believe. The Messiah, now, now in describes, interpreted out of the Talmud, remains wounded as well. He does not bleed from every wound like the other poor folks at the gate. However, he is aware. He is attentive to his wounds. He is also attentive to the wounds of others, who we, he will leave his place at the gate to go and help. He sits and stands in solidarity with the people at the gate. He is among them. The Messiah knows he is like the wounded. He understands his own need and the needs of others as places where the glory of God might be seen. Christianity is an incredibly personal faith. It is a body, religion, and we are a diverse body, a diverse congregation with diverse bodies and with diverse needs for those bodies. Now one calls not just individuals, but collectives to this attentiveness as well. In the final chapter of The Wounded Healer, he says, a Christian community is therefore a healing community, not because wounds are cured and pains are alleviated, but because wounds and pains become opening or occasions for new vision. Mutual confession then becomes mutual deepening of hope, and shared weakness becomes a reminder to one and to all of the coming strength. And this church, this church, looks a bit different from when I started attending in the pandemic in fall of 2020, the beginning of my seminary education that I hope to finish this year. We have new space sharers who call this place a home and a refuge. Our capital campaign continues to flourish. We will celebrate 150 years of good and hard work as a body later this year. And with all of those beautiful things in mind, I still know what will speak to God's power from our corner of creation is this, that mutual confession and hope, the admission of our shared weakness. This, this is solidarity. It is an understanding of our deep need for one another. Here we might not be able to offer a solution to the pain but here we can also not pretend that we are like unbroken, all-powerful super apostles who know and can speak to everything. Here we only know that the world has a hard time holding our thorns and caring for our wounds. Here at this church, we offer to be mindful and compassionate to others as we want others to be for us. Our call as a church, I hope and I feel and I pray, is to be a place out of many where folks can find that pressure alleviated, not gone, alleviated. It must be a place where there is no place for what now and names in that passage. There must be no room for racism or oppression within these walls, no hatred and fear. We cannot have none of that which pushes our thorns further up and inside us. We must just, just this, look at one another with understanding, accepting that we are just as wounded as our neighbor. We have to fill this room with so much deep mutual understanding that there becomes no room for shame. That has been my experience of this church, as someone who hopes to be ordained here, like right there. As someone who came from a place of spiritual hurt, that this place has been a refuge. And I hope if you really get nothing from this sermon, you just take that. And this, an honest question, what would it look like to center that principle of mutual confession and hope and shared weakness in the midst of all our other beautiful hard work? See, to be a church with an intact and sealed roof, but to also be a place where we love recklessly and without abandon, where we see with a radical understanding of one another's weakness coming out of our simple acceptance of our own and the power that weakness can show when you bind it effectively, the change that can occur when you do so, when you care for it in the company of others. The brilliant bursting light coming through the gauze, 
Our gauze we wind and we unwind over our wounds. We bind and unbind, watching and waiting and witnessing for what, we will, what will save us. Being attentive, listening deeply, loving one another, reminding all, one and all, of the power that is to come that we see in part now, that our Christ has a body, that Christ does not simply wait for us suspended in midair to notice him, Christ, that Christ is with us now, here and now, wounded as well, in our weakness now, and in our strength to come. Amen. <laughs>